Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. Mike, we braved the snow to get this Ask Mike done today. You know how bad I hate this weather. <laughs> I know you do. I don't like snow. I don't like cold. I hate winter. It just depresses me. Yeah, you so have... So I'm, I'm like having to force myself to be happy right now. Yeah, you have sad. What do they call it? Seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, you don't like, like it. Yeah, you just... I, in my house, I have... What, uh, daylight bulbs everywhere because I've read that that makes it more like yeah. being outside. Oh, there you because go. Because other than if, if you go around with the regular bulbs that are yellow and everything, you just sit around and get depressed. Wow. I don't know that it's helped, but <laughs> I don't have a choice either because I'm not going outside if no. I don't have to. No, exactly. But we're indoors. We're nice and warm in our studios today, and we're going to have a great Ask Mike show for you. We have a lot of questions this week, Mike, and a lot of them about basketball. So let's get right into it, shall we? Our first question is from Mousetown, who asks, do you think that Muss still has time to turn this team around? I don't. I don't think he could do it if he had an extra month. This is a bad basketball team. You know, I don't think it's a bad team, but I think it's a pretty mediocre team. And I think it's been made to look worse by the fact that the SEC is a lot better this year. There are more good teams. There might be, th what did we name, four uh, Four Van teams that Vanderbilt, we did, yeah. Missouri, Arkansas, and South Carolina. South Carolina. Those are the four that probably, they're not going anywhere. They, I don't even know if they're, <laughs> they're in the NIT. But when you get past that, everybody else is capable of making the tournament. And I really think we, we may see a reversal of what we've seen the last few years because the last few years, you've had teams like Auburn, Alabama, Kentucky, make the NCAA tournament, do well in the conference, and then just flame out, whereas Arkansas, like last year, finishes down. They finished below 500 in the conference and then went further than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Arkansas makes it this year, but it is going to be interesting to see what Auburn does, what Kentucky does, what maybe uh, Georgia does, or maybe what Florida does. I think there could be several SEC, if, if nine get in, what if we have six that are playing on Saturday of the first week? And what if four make it to the Sweet 16? And what if three make it to the Elite Eight? And what if two make it to the Final Four? It's going to be interesting to see if this is the year in which the SEC conference race translates to the tournament as opposed to what's happened the last few years where these teams look well, good in the conference and then flame out, except yeah. for Arkansas. Absolutely, and I think you mm -hmm. make a, gr a great point there that people just don't really get because they want to bring up the example all the time. I see it all over social media. Gosh, you guys are too quick to judge this team. Look at what happened in years past where they've started off bad in conference play. This is a different situation, everybody. Let me just say that very, very plainly and clearly. This is a different season. This is a different situation than in years past where the competition level, I think the SEC is always a pretty tough conference to play in when you, when you come to, uh, to you know, basketball um, when you come to tournament time and things like that. But this year, it's just a different story. And even when you look at Joe Lenardi, when he does his bracket predictions, I mean, it, the SEC has the most teams in of any conference, and there's a reason for that. The level of competition is just different, different this year, Mike. Uh, WV Hog fan says, in 08, we beat ranked Oklahoma and Texas, and expectations were high. Then we won only two conference games. This season, we beat Purdue and Duke and have performed poorly in conference play. Is history repeating? I haven't seen this theory. Well, it's not that bad. Uh, that team, that Pelfrey team, had a tremendous uh, November and December and then just flamed out after beating two really good teams in late December. They won two conference games. It was baffling. But this staff is better than that staff, believe me. That's the worst coaching staff we've ever had at this school. Rob Evans was the only guy Pelfrey ever had on his staff that knew how to coach. Pelfrey couldn't coach. The rest of the guys couldn't coach. And that was a bad basketball team. This team might win six games. They're not going to end up with two. They might win six. I think that's six, maybe seven at the most, unless something really dramatic changes. They're not going. I mean, we can debate this. I've had 10 different theories over the last month about what's wrong with this team, and I'm not sure any of them are correct. <clears throat> and one of the th reasons I'm not sure is we're not there. We don't see what's happening in practice. Theory number one is that the, 
the, this class, this portal group was overrated. It was okay. a top five portal class, and it's really not that good. That's a theory. Okay, maybe. I mean, this has happened before, <clears throat> but it also could be that when you take these players individually in the teams they were on and you put them on another team with another coach and in a different situation, they don't produce with the same results. The other thing could be that a lot of times when guys hit the portal for the first time, and, th and this is all new to us, they're getting NIL money for the first time. I don't know anything about the NIL money for basketball. It's supposedly not big, but maybe you're certainly, you transfer and you're going to get some money and you didn't have it before. Maybe that changes things. There's a lot of things. And then there's the idea, and, and it was advanced last week when we got this question about Gus Arginal not being on the staff. Right. Maybe there was something with him. We all know Musselman is an, a really intense guy. He's not your buddy. He's not a reinforce you, make you feel good about yourself. He is a kick you in the butt, tell you off, put you on the bench if you're not, and, and he does that all the time. He does, yeah. Guys that make him mad go to the bench. That's why his lineup is constantly changing. So maybe Arginal was the guy, the good cop guy that came back and made him feel better. And if you don't have that this year, everybody's mad. We've already heard the story that at least one of these players early on told Musselman, you can't talk to me that way. We, we've heard rumors about how he talks to these guys. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have said personally, because I started in the seventh grade with football with a coach that just would trash you. He was, he, he, we all thought he hated us. He screamed at us, cussed at us, but I adjusted to that because he said one thing to me, and he said, you probably are not a football player, but as long as you're out here, you got a chance to be. And so I developed this attitude in life that no matter what I run into, no matter how hard it is, if I don't give up, if I don't quit, then I'm going to be all right. So People like me adjust to guys like that, Musselman. They, they, they wouldn't affect us as much as it would other people. But it's a different world these days. A lot of these athletes are saying, you can't talk to me that way. You can't do this to me. And I'm not going to respond to you if you do. And then you throw in NIL, that complicates it even more. Because a player suddenly feels like he's a little more on equal footing. You're not this coach that makes all this money, and I'm just this guy on scholarship. I got a little bit of money here. You can't tell me what to do. So you could introduce some of that into it. And then there's this other theory that we talked about, which is sometimes you end up with a bunch of guys that can't, that won't succeed in your system. And as a coach, because high school coaches have to do this. They don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. They don't get to recruit, most of them. You get what you've got. And I watched that in my hometown from the time I was a little kid all the way up to when I played. You just had what you had, and the coaches had to adjust, <clears throat> come up with new defenses, new offenses, because they looked at their personnel and they went, ah, what would work best with these guys? And they'd start calling up another coach. Hey, you run this wide tackle six defense. I've heard about it, but we've never run it, but I think it would work with us. What do you think? Okay, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go with that. Must doesn't do that. It's his system. What if these guys don't do well in his system? And what if the real problem here is an inability to adjust to, you, to, to run an offense that works best for them? Now, we do know he's adjusted a little bit because they've started to run his own defense. And it was working. It was, so you know. maybe that's the first step. But why aren't they succeeding offensively? Why do all these guys look like ball, bad ball handlers? Why do, why do they throw the ball away all the time? Why is this? Why are they letting themselves be pushed around? The word that we're getting, and it's all over the internet. The way to beat Arkansas is just to hit them in the mouth, because <laughs> they will back down. Yes, and that's what we're seeing teams do. So why is that happening? What's wrong there? Well, do you just have a bunch of wussy guys that don't, <laughs> that won't that won't fight back? Uh, how come we don't have any more? Uh, Bladen blockers, you know, that kid, will, he, he will go straight inside, go to the hoop, he doesn't care. Nope. Now yeah. he's out of control a, a lot. Well, was a freshman, so. But he doesn't get pushed around. Why don't more of them play that way? What is wrong with Jalen Graham? Why does he get in there? Is he too small to be doing what he's doing? Because he looks good at times, and then other times he just folds. What's wrong with Makai Mitchell? 
maybe there's an issue here where this kid has no confidence. You took his brother away. He'd always been playing with him. Yeah, you took him yeah. away. He's kind of, maybe his brother was a, a support for him. Absolutely. Okay, you got a guy that plays well in spurts in certain games, and you say if he could do that all the time, here's what he reminds me of. Okay. He reminds me of Miriam Dowda on the women's team. The way she was inconsistent That's a good comparison. last year. Yeah. But look what's happened to her this year. They've somehow figured out a way to give her confidence, and but she's was, getting better yeah. and better and better. Could he do that? If you're screaming at him and getting mad at him all the time, maybe that doesn't do it for him. Maybe somebody needs to sit down with him and say, "Look, man, you're better than this. Come on, let's let's figure out a way to get you more active." Yeah. Stop doubting what you're doing. Yeah. Let's get into this thing. Turn when you catch the ball a foot from the basket, turn and dunk it. You can do that. When you get ready to play defense, don't back down from a guy. Get in his face. Maybe that's what he needs. You bring up a lot of good questions, but I go back to something that you said in that answer, Mike. And we don't have the answers to them because we're we not don't see it. We don't see it. We're not at practice. And people always laugh at me because they go, well, what do you see in the, the 10 minutes that you get to go to football? Well, there is something that you can see. You can see how the coaches are acting around them. You can kind of get a feeling around how the players are responding to certain, uh, to responding to a loss, things like that. I want to, if I could see five minutes of practice, I could kind of get a feel for, okay, maybe this is what's going on. But we don't see anything. We don't know at all what's going on behind closed doors. And as much as I believe, I, I want to believe Musselman in saying that practices are great. We have the hardest practices we, we have. We, they're just not translating. Is there something deeper? Is it a mindset issue? Because that's what it looks like to me, where you bring up all these different theories. You bring up Makai Mitchell. This team, I feel like, has the potential to be more than a mediocre, mediocre team. They're playing like one right now. But is it a mindset issue? Sure. Well, we'll see. A lot of theories. A lot of theories. H.L. McCamish says, this season is proof that portal rankings are not a guarantee of anything. This was supposedly a top five class, like you mentioned, Mike. Whoever ranks this stuff needs to find another job. Maybe you need to not place so much faith in rankings. There's so many things that can, can be off about that. Again, we talked about that earlier. You don't know what happens to a guy when he goes from coach A to coach B, teammates A to teammates B. He gets some NIL money. There's so many factors that can change a player where he can be pretty good at one place and then not as good as another place. Ideally, what will happen is a player will be smart enough to go from a situation where he's going to improve, and that happens a lot, but not always. There's no guarantee of it. And I think as long as Musselman is here, and as long as he's rebuilding teams that way, you're going to have a chance of something like this. But it's only happened once in four years. You know, if it happened every year, you'd say, well, you know, I better change your way of doing this. <laughs> but I don't think you can just look at this year and ca call that a failure. Yeah. It's just what we just got through talking about all the theories, whatever ends up being correct. The bottom line is the rebuilding of the team this year didn't work, or it hasn't so far. Yeah, and you and like H.L. McCamish brings up, you got to take those portal rankings with a bit of a grain of salt, right? Because you have to look at it from that attitude of, hey, they are ranking people based off of what they've done at a previous program and their talent. They're taking their stats into account, their talent level, and they're putting it all into their ranking system. But like you said, there are so many factors that get into it when they get on campus. So... It's great to have a top five portal ranking, but hey, you never know what's going to happen when they get actually get here and get in the system. Hot Dogger says, I have a feeling NIL has made players less motivated to play hard and win in college sports. They are looking ahead to getting a paycheck, and it doesn't mean as much to give your all playing for a college team. I'm thinking this applies more towards basketball and this year's team. I'm thinking it the opposite of that. I think yeah. it applies more to the football team this year. Yeah. Again, we haven't heard about any NIL issues with this team. That doesn't mean that that absolutely couldn't be. But I think it, it would have filtered out by now. We'd be hearing stuff about guys. I just don't know that there are guys on this basketball team that are making giant NL, NIL money and others making none. Well, you just have to – the proof is in uh, some of those NIL – you know, you look at the NIL rankings that they have of right. college athletes – I have not noticed many college ba of our Arkansas basketball players in those rankings. Devo's the only one that shows up kind of consistently. Yeah. So, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know how much that is true. Again, we don't know how much money these players are making. We've talked about that on the show before. Yeah, well, the point he, he's making is good. It's valid. No. I agree with that. I just don't necessarily think it's what's wrong with this basketball team. If we could go back to football, I, look, I don't care if I make anybody mad about this because, uh, you know, K.J. Jefferson is sacrosanct to a lot of Razorback fans. If you don't think he played a role in what happened to that football team, you weren't paying attention. He had issues. Look at his body language when he came two, three, four straight, th four, three and outs, and he would come back to the, to the bench. Did he get up? Was he talking to the offensive lineman? Was he getting those guys pumped up? Were they in a little group talking about anything? Or was he sitting over there by himself? This is a guy that went on social media and showed his Corvette. He showed his he showed yeah he, he showed up to a game in a Versa in a Versace suit right, right. or a, a Hogwarts. Eve Saint yeah Eve Saint Laurent or something okay so that's being tone deaf in my opinion because you're showing off how much more money you have how much more you've succeeded than the other guys on the team the other guy that had a big nil was Rocket Sanders mm -hmm. he didn't exactly have a good year did he. Mm -hmm. I don't know that all of that was NIL, but what I'm saying is when there's a huge imbalance, that's when you get the problem. And this is not going away unless somebody does something about it. It's that ability to come in and hire an NIL agent, which everyone says is perfectly legal, even the NCAA is not challenging it. I'm going to come in, I'm going to be a, I don't know, think of an example of somebody that's got a giant NIL and didn't earn it. Because they're they're everywhere. <laughs> what, what about maybe Arch Manning? Arch, Arch Manning. Manning comes to mind. I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> it, you have the ability to go and market yourself because of who you are, and some uh, auto dealership or or what if Walmart? What if Arkansas got a guy in two years and he was so popular that Walmart felt like, hey, we could take this guy and, and he would be a spokesman for us. And he's such a, a good spokesman, mm -hmm. he, he would actually be worth a lot of money to us. Yeah. He could get a $10 million NIL. There's nothing to stop him from doing this. But what you people that think this is okay don't get is what that's going to do to the game. If you think players are going to just sit back and go, yeah, I'm getting 3000 a month. This guy's getting 100000 a million or whatever. That's not going to bother me. I promise you it's going to cause problems. I, I now, think it already is. Somebody said to me, well, it doesn't cause problems in the NFL. They're all getting paid. You know, nobody's making 3000 a month in the NF, in, NFL. They're at least getting good money. And, and the fact that others are getting millions, I still think it's an issue, but it's not as big an issue. And the point is, you're kind of free to move around there. You can get traded, you can let people know, I want to go over here and I'll make more money here. You're an adult there. These are college guys, not that far out of high school. And when you're asking them to sit there and go, this guy I'm blocking for is making a ton of money and I'm getting nothing. And I'm, I don't want to single out Arkansas or KJ or anything like that. This is happening all over the place and it's not gonna go away. I think you're right, the difference is for me, when you look at, like you're saying, everybody in the NFL gets paid, but I even look at the quarterbacks that treat their offensive linemen to new Xboxes and uh, nice nice suits and nice watches, right? That's they're the way to handle it. Exactly. They're taking care of them. So they're going, not only am I getting paid, but my quarterback loves me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing that. That's it's, the only way this will work. It's Exactly. And it's different because college players, not saying they're not as nice as uh, the quarterbacks in the NFL, but they may or they may be young and a little bit like, oh, I'm making all this money. And I'm going to go really spend. they don't really see what it's doing. Exactly. Exactly, Mike. I agree completely with you there. Marty Bird's proxy says, with high school guys, there's coaches, teachers, and administrators you can talk to about kids. With portal guys, do they call up and say, hey, coach, I'm recruiting your player. Is he okay? I wouldn't think so. Actually, you and I have discussed this, yeah. and we both agree that that happens a lot. It does. Because what you what you may not understand is a lot of coaches have a good working relationship with each other, even though they're opposing coaches. So if there's a coach out there you respect, and you're going to lose a player no matter what, he's in the portal, and you don't believe that Coach B over here really pulled him out by giving him some kind of offer before he was in the portal, in other words, he's not stealing him from you, then yeah, you could say, yeah, this here's an honest evaluation of him. He's really good in this situation. We had problems with him here. And I think that happens a lot. Now, 
if you got uh, two coaches that don't like each other, probably he's not going to help you out. He's not going to. You probably wouldn't even call the guy. But you can still go back to. You got to look at the video of the guy. Yeah. I think that's a lot of it. You just look at his stats and you you watch a lot of video of him, and you can evaluate a lot from that. Where you where you're trying to find out stuff that you don't know about is what's in here, what's in here, up here, that's, yeah. and that's where you can still go back to their high school teachers, people that knew him growing up, his own parents, pe friends of his parents. You can still find out about a guy. They're they're three four years out of high school. They didn't suddenly change because they went off to to college. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of. I think it's maybe a little more difficult to get good information on a portal guy. As opposed to a high school kid, but I don't think it's a, I don't think the process is a lot different. No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I mean, I I know that it's not a ton different because my dad will call up coaches that he knows and go, "Hey, uh, notice this guy was in the portal. What's what's the story there?" He'll just even ask, "What's the story there? What's going on with that?" Uh, he he asks a lot about what you can't see on tape. Sure. Does he have an attitude issue? Is he going to fit in with, with our culture here? Is he going to fit in with the rest of the team? Does he want to be a star? If he, my dad coaches the D2 level, coming down from the D1 level to the D2 level, d does he have that attitude issue of, like, I want to be the biggest, uh, the biggest thing uh, since sliced bread when he walks into the gym every day? I think a lot of day. fans tend to think that coaches don't like each other <laughs> because they have to coach <laughs> against each other. Yes. They're the enemy. Yeah. The truth is most of the time, once the game is over, they're fine. They, they have a good working relationship. I think even Musselman actually brought that up where he says, you know, with the SEC, we all know each other. We have to sit by each other at conferences. We have to sit by each other and talk to each other at, at, before the season begins. And so you get to have a really good working relationship. There are some relationships that aren't good. We do know that. Uh, and I know that from my dad who talks to me about, oh, yeah, this guy doesn't like this guy. Oh, they would never t talk right. to each other. But a lot of them do have really good sure. working relationships. So. Uh, Kansas Hogg asks, why has Musselman been hiding Pinion and Blocker on the bench? He finally lets them play, and look what they did. This is one of my pet peeves because it applies to any sport. There's always the guy on the bench or guys on the bench that if you only played them, everything would be different, right? Yes. And so somebody has that theory, and they sit there, and they stew, and then finally they get to play a little bit, and because they play okay, the answer is just right there. Look. Here's the issue with this. <laughs> You're asking me to believe that a guy like Eric Musselman, who's around these players every day in practice and sees them and the other coaches see them, that they're just going to put a guy on the bench and, and be totally clueless to the fact that he is the difference between winning and losing. Now, in the, in the case of these two players, they both came in and played reasonably well, you know, against Florida. The, yeah. They, had, they were... Low double digits, I think 12 points each or something like that. They shot reasonably well. Pinion made all of his free throws. That was impressive on a team that misses free throws all, of, all over the place. Although Blocker was 6 of 10, so he just shot 60%. They both had a couple of turnovers, so that's four turnovers. I think they had too many fouls between them. But they played okay. Okay, they're the difference makers. You got beat by 22 points, and they played a lot in this game. So you're going to convince me that's the difference? Now, if Arkansas had won or come within five points or something like that, then we'd, have, we'd be having a different discussion here. But you're not going to convince me that those guys should have been playing all along a lot when you play them a lot and you get beat by 22 points. He has tried every possible combination of players this year. It doesn't make any difference. When you get beat by 30-plus, when you get beat by 20-plus and 20-plus, there's no answer there. There's not some magical answer. If we just play this guy, everything will be okay. I mean, If you're losing by one or two points, maybe. Not by 20, not by 30. Absolutely, and you have to look further back than just one game. Every player can have a really great one game. What you want is consistency. And we go back to the conversation we had last week is that None of these players right now are being very consistent. They'll have one great game and then they'll fall off, you know. Or, you know, you, you look at guys like L. Ellis, who really sparked at the beginning of the year. Where's he gone? He plays like maybe two, three minutes a game. You know, Caleb Battle, where's he gone? Tremont Mark turns it on sometimes. But you can't just have the inconsistency from night to night. And I think that's where Musselman struggles a little bit. He goes, okay, I played you. 
Pinion, can you keep it up? Layden, can you keep it up? Well, I agree that at some point he's got to pick out a lineup and play it <laughs> and stop getting yeah. mad when somebody doesn't play well. Absolutely. I agree with because you there. Because we're, we're past that point. Yeah. You just, I mean, you absolutely just have to play the guys that you feel confident in playing. And if they don't play well, they don't play well. Yeah. I mean, that's just kind of a... At the end of the day, you can't keep switching people out and not giving people enough time to get settled even in a game. That's my thing. It's like you're not even giving these guys enough time to really get settled. You're going, two minutes, take them out. Two yeah. minutes, take them out. I'm like, I need to see these guys play a little bit, get their feet under them. Chuck F. says, Musk is the best we've had since Nolan. Want to try and get Heath, Pelfrey, or Anderson back? If people keep up this nonsense, we may have the chance. Yeah, there's been some of that. I looked at social media, and I didn't feel like it, they were just crucifying him. There are some points to be made. Yeah. I think one thing we're, we're hearing a lot of is people saying, you don't take accountability yourself. It's always on the player. You don't say it was on me. Yeah. We, it's on the staff. we got to figure it out. That's just not his style. If you are a fan expecting him to do that, expecting him to be more like um, Pittman, who does that, does that a lot, He's just a different style. It doesn't personally bother me because I think if he said that stuff and he didn't mean it, what difference would it make? So if he actually believes that it's, and I do believe that, a lot of times it is on the players. doesn't mean it's always on the players. So it doesn't personally bother me that Musk doesn't talk that way. But it may bother some fans. Now, this I whole, think it, bo it might bother the players, too. The well, players hear that, okay. and the players see I'll, that. I'll concede that. Yeah. But here's the real issue. Because what he's saying is we may get the chance to go back to those guys, those other coaches. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of people that believe Musk is not going to be here very long. Not, not, you know, he's, he loves to go to Southern California. He's made no secret of the fact that he enjoys it out there. Yeah. Well, that's his home. And yeah, that's his home. so there are people that believe once he gets a good offer out there, whether it's San Diego State or UCLA or USC or school like that, he's gone. Maybe. Uh, if that happens, it happens. Nobody guarantees you a coach who's successful is going to stay here forever. Yeah. Then the, what, what happens is it falls upon your check to find another guy like that. I mean, <laughs> that's what you get paid for. It's really tough, yeah. So uh, I don't think that Musselman will leave because of people complaining on social oh, media. Oh, no. If he leaves, it's because he'd rather be in that warm weather instead of what we're dealing with right now. Be closer to home, be closer to mom. His mom lives out there. Right. So I understand, I understand that. And, it, and if he leaves, he leaves, guys. I mean, that's, yeah, that's you just you it. Can't, you can't worry about that. Exactly. Dr. Stark says, this is an interesting one, Mike. We talked about this before the show. Loved Mike railing against socialism while simultaneously lobbying for all collegiate athletes to make the same exact stipend. Courtney's reaction was pretty priceless. I don't remember my reaction. Because you this. basically understood what I was saying yes. and didn't disagree with me. No, let's, yeah. Let's revisit that just to sort of explain. It started off with me talking about Harbaugh's, what I thought was his totally disingenuous idea of coaches should make less because players could make more. Okay, he's going to get a raise one way or another. He's either going to get another job, he's either going to get a raise where he is, or he's going to the NFL. Mm -hmm. You think he's going to make less money no. after winning a national championship? No, and he's not going to give himself a pay cut to spread that out amongst it's his players. It's just not happening. And so I, it was a stupid idea. I, I think he was just trying to make himself look good, and I personally don't have an issue with coaches getting paid whatever – the, the school is willing to pay for it because it's the law of supply and demand. This is what it takes to get a coach that will win 10 games for you. It, you can't do it for four million. It's going to take nine or 10. You got to pay him that to keep him. You know, they kept Saban because they kept giving him raises. He probably would have gone somewhere else if they didn't. Yeah. So I don't have an issue with that. It is our, our, our system of economics in this country. It works pretty much that way all over the country. Each one of us has a job here, and we are paid based on what our employer thinks we bring value to the company. So nobody, we don't all make the same. Uh, they may feel like this guy over here brings less value than this woman over here, and they're not going to walk in and say, we're giving you this and we're giving you that. You get different amounts, yeah. but that is the way this works. Now, so why is it different when we're talking about NIL? Because you don't have a choice, and we're fixing to find that out. The NCAA has already said it. When you deal with college athletes, they are in a university environment. If it's a public school, if it's not private, if it's a public school, they are subject 
to federal regulations. This is where NIL came from 40 years ago. If you go back far enough, schools were just having scholarships for all these men sports and the women hardly got anything. Yeah. And basically there was a lawsuit and the federal government stepped in and said, hey, if you're gonna have this many sports and this many scholarships for men, you gotta offer a similar amount to women. And that's how it all came about. Well, do you think that we're gonna sit here and distribute this in? Because I wanna make a, a distinction here between you an athlete coming in and hiring an agent and getting your own NIL deal as opposed to a collective, yeah. which is what Arkansas is doing right now with this new EDGE program. M fans funnel money into that EDGE program, which goes into the athletic department, and then they decide who gets what. Okay, if they don't distribute that evenly, what is going to happen? Oh, it's already started to happen. You've got lawsuits that have been filed because a lot of these people are saying, wait a minute, the women are getting almost none of this. Yeah. You have a few examples of Angel, whatever her name Angel is. Angel Reese and yeah. Libby Dunn. And but yeah. th th they're working their own NIL deals. That's not part of a collective. Mm -mm. So what I was saying is this is the only answer for the collectives is for everybody to get the same because you don't have a choice. The federal government will regulate that. It doesn't have anything to do with whether I like it or not. Now, I would prefer that. I would prefer to get rid of the ability to do your own NIL deal because you're not out in the real world yet. You're a college student. I think that it's different. And it, we go back to what I was saying before. When you can make a million dollars and some other guy's getting his own little collective of, I don't know, a thousand a month or whatever, it's not going to work. People are going to resent it. The imbalance is going to be there and it's going to blow up. Well, it's already, you're already seeing that athletes are starting to get annoyed at different things and money and things like that. I mean, that's the whole reason that, uh, like, Wright's Barbecue is going out and doing the big pig fund, trying to raise money for the guys in the trenches, you know, because they're not getting any love. And you're going to see, start to see some of those guys going, well, what the heck, what but, about me? But, but because they're dealing with college athletes, you're not going to be able to give them money like that through a collective mm. and, and have it be unevenly distributed. It will yeah. have to go to everybody or it won't work. Absolutely, because you're, again, like, like it's been it happening before with scholarships and, and Title IX. You brought up Title IX as well. It's the same situation that you're going to have in the future with NIL. And I wish the, the NCAA would test this through lawsuits. Just let, them, let themselves get sued because I still say they'll win. Once again, this is an organization called the NCAA. They have organized it 70 or 80 years ago with certain rules. If you want to be a part of the NCAA, these are our rules. They're not laws, they're rules. And as a part of our rules, we don't want athletes getting a lot of money here. We, we, the, the benefits they will get is through their scholarship, and that's the way it's worked. And everyone says it's unfair, it's unfair, it's unfair. They're not adults yet. They're not out in the real world. They're getting a college education. I, do I believe they should have upped the, the money available? Yes, which they did through the cost of attendance scholarship several years ago. And if they want to add to that, that's fine. I don't like the idea that you can be an independent businessman and get your own NIL deals while you're a college student. But That's for something for you to do when you're outside the NCAA. If you don't like it, don't be a part of this. Well, I think the biggest argument that for people had with NIL, and the one of the biggest things is why should Joe Schmo and Nantucket be getting money off of my name, image, and likeness? Those people, these random sellers across the United States, were selling uh, jerseys yes. and things and making money off of other people's own faces, names. Like that's exactly why we got into this argument in the first place is because why should those people be making money off of somebody they don't even know? Which, which is somebody a totally they're not separate affiliate. issue from me going to a school, hiring an agent, and the agent procures me a deal of $3 million a year. Right, but it, once you open the floodgates, right, this is why, like you said, you have to put some restrictions on it. But there, there's the NCAA is like, hands off, we can't do that. So We're not are going to we do that. To, so are we going to have a professional, is college football going to turn into professional sports with a 32-team yeah. NFL-like thing? Yes. And if we do that, what's going to happen? We talked about this last week. You, all these people that are fans of schools that aren't in that little exclusive club, 
they're going to say screw that to those people. They're not going to stay fans of those schools. They're going to watch. They're going to watch their own games involving their own teams. I, that's where you and I disagree because I think you. I think you are going to still have fans Here's of what those I teams. Know. You know what I watch on TV? I watch SEC games. I watch other SEC right. teams because I'm interested. In, I don't watch a lot of Big 12 in those other conferences. And I'm telling you, when you get this super-duper conference, if your team is not in it, you're going to watch teams in the, that your team plays. Yeah. You're going to be much more interested in the teams your team plays than these teams you're never going to play. And you're going to have a resentment toward them anything anyway because they're over here being big shots while your team has been shuffled off to nothing. Well, they're I mean, going to ruin this thing, I'm telling you. I, I won't be around to see it. It's going to take longer than that. But I'm glad I won't because the college football that I've loved and the college basketball and all these sports, baseball, it's – it's going to be blown up. It's, it's all turned into professional sports. It is going to change, absolutely. It is going to change. I don't I like mean, it. I, I know like you guys don't. guys that play because they love the game, not because they're making a crap load of money. And some of them get to go on and be professional athletes and make a crap load of money. The rest of them, you know what they do? They're like the guy I know at the paint store yeah. that I talk to him two or three times a month. And he's just as happy as he can be because he was a Razorback years ago and he loved doing that. And he's not mad that somebody didn't give him a gajillion dollars while he did it. There are still people like that, Mike. There are. There are still athletes like that, trust me, because there are athletes right now on, on Arkansas's campus that are here because they want to be Razorbacks that aren't making $100 million in NIL. There are. You, you, you will see that. But it is going to change if, if like you said, there isn't some sort of hay we if, gotta get a handle on all of this. If what we saw this past fall is the way it's gonna be, I don't wanna. I don't wanna even cover it. Okay. I don't want a team that you sit there and lay an egg in front of your own fans against Auburn. You don't even compete. You don't even try to compete against Missouri. You don't. It just doesn't matter. I don't want to watch a team like that. I, I, because I, I, agree. I don't like watching teams a team that like... would bow up and do anything to win those games. <laughs> I, yeah. and, and if so, if you're going to throw money into the mix and make everybody either want the money, I'm either getting it or I'm not. And if I'm not, I'm mad. But if I'm getting it, I don't really care one way or the other. No, that's not as – I still – there's still a little part of me was that kid that learned to play football in the street when I was five years old and thought it was the greatest game ever and had so much fun doing that. That's, that's at the heart of playing football at whatever level. Part yeah. of playing any sport. I mean, anything. You could relate that to basketball, baseball, soccer, gymnastics. I mean, you name it, softball. That is that is the heart of what all of these sports are about. But right now, the landscape is changing. And, and I agree with you, Mike. I don't want to watch what happened last year with football either. But something has got to, to give, right? Something has got to happen. Got and I'm not that person who can make that call. Neither are you, right? Got a buddy in Lubbock. Yeah. Texas Tech is having a good season. I think they've lost two games the last time I checked. Wow. They're really doing well in the Big 12. I figured he'd be all happy. I called him because I'm saying, well, Arkansas stinks, but, you know, your team's having a good year. He said, I don't care about them anymore. I said, why? And he said, there's not a single guy on that team from anywhere around here. Hmm. They brought them in from other places, and they're all paying them money to be here. How do I think they're Red Raiders? They're just guys that got hired to be brought in here, and we're supposed to watch them and get excited. He said, I don't care anymore, and he doesn't watch. Hmm. He's just giving up. Okay. I'm telling you, that may only be a few people right now, but it's going to spread. Okay. It's going to get worse, and then what we're going to be left with is all these people out here that love pro sports, they're going to be happy because now college is going to be pro sports. But those of us that didn't like professional sports, that liked the college game, we're going to go off in some other direction where there's still teams that play, guys that still play for fun. Okay, we'll see what happens. That's maybe way in the future, or maybe not in the near future, maybe, but we'll see what happens. Hog Regnick says, you finally got what you've been asking for. The NCAA is going after Florida State for using an NIL deal to recruit a high school player. Seems like everybody is doing this. Why Florida State? There were some circumstances here that were a little bit different. You had a coach on the team mm -hmm. actually arrange a meeting between a, a recruit a guy they were recruiting, a high school kid, and, a, and an NIL person that would give them an NIL deal, and he even drove the kid to the meeting. Yeah. That's pretty blatant. Uh, and apparently Florida State's okay with it. They've accepted their punishment. Yeah. Yeah. They got caught. They made a mistake. Okay, there's that. How does, this have, how does this spread to other schools that are doing the same thing but not getting caught? Maybe they're a little more careful. 
I don't know. The problem is the NCAA has never really seriously investigated cheating, in my opinion. What they've done is they've caught schools that were blatantly cheating, but when it was a little harder to catch somebody, they just went, eh, it's too hard to figure that out. they got to mm -hmm. stop that. Yeah. If you're either serious about enforcing the rules or you're not, what Florida State did, a lot of teams are doing. They just, it just does, didn't happen that way. They didn't have that much information on it. Get off your rear end and start investigating them because you know they're doing it. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. There's a one base. There's two basic NIL rules. Everybody's violating. Well, not everybody, but almost everybody is violating the first rule, which is you cannot offer an NIL deal to a high school kid. Mm -hmm. You can only offer it to him after he signs with you. That's not hard to understand. How many schools do you think are violating that oh, right a now? Well, a ton, because what they're doing is they're doing it in a backdoor way that it can't be traced back to the coach so offering the deal. Better, you get away with it. Absolutely. That's, and that's also, the problem. And, and also another problem is that the, the NCAA, most of these, like I'm sure with Florida State, somebody turned them in for this, right? It requires somebody to go, hey, I think this is happening. And a lot of them don't want to snitch on each other, like coaches. and Well, you and, definitely don't want to snitch on somebody if you're doing it yourself. Well, tr absolutely, right? So it's almost like a, a, a group of people that's like, all right, I won't tell on you. If you don't tell on me, sure. we won't snitch. I mean, that's what you're getting to where somebody in this Florida State, why Florida State? Well, probably somebody said, hey, they did this. So and, uh, yeah. what I'm waiting for is the next investigation. Are okay. you going to go investigate somebody else where it's not quite as obvious? Very true. Are you going to put some legwork into this, some, you know, get some real <laughs> investigative things? If you're paying a guy that, to investigate, that requires the make NCAA. him investigate. <laughs> Mike, that requires the NCAA to do some work there. That, I mean, right. I, they don't do a lot of work. So uh, <laughs> that requires them to get their thinking caps on and do some investigations. Uh, Eddie Lynn wants to know, are coaches going to end up giving players NIL bonuses to keep them from leaving bowl games. What an interesting concept. More and more playing college football is just about money. I hate it. Uh, we talked about this last week. I think it's going to be much less of an issue next year with 12 teams in the playoff. I can't imagine if your team makes the playoff, you leaving early. Well, no, you're not going to leave. So but what if gonna, you're not in the playoff? Okay, there's, there are going to be all the rest of those teams that are in normal non-playoff type bowls. Yeah. Yes, you can still lose those, but that's been going on forever. Right, but that's but it needs to change. Eddie Lynn, I mean, brings up a good point. Well, I mean, they've do you done give it them before. a little bonus? They've done it before and didn't pay anybody a bonus. I mean, Arkansas yeah. lost a guy. I can't remember. It was 15, 20 years ago. There was a guy, a real good player, that just went out before the bowl game. Yeah. And they just can't. It happens. Yeah, it does. Uh, here's what I think you do as a coach. If you're in a non-bowl game, Liberty Bowl, you know, yeah, yeah. it was Wacko Bowl in Shreveport, <laughs> whatever that's called. <laughs> Wacko they, well, Bowl Well, they changed the name of We Wacko I, Bowl. They changed the name of it. I kind of like year. Wacko Bowl, though. If you're in one of those bowl games and you lose your quarterback or your top running back or two of your offensive linemen, look at it as an opportunity to get a head start on next year. You're starting a new quarterback. Mm -hmm. The guy you, you may think is your quarterback for next year, you get a chance to look at him in a bowl game. You get a chance to look at a couple of linemen, some defensive players. So rather than it being a problem, and especially if you're a fan of those schools, instead of looking at it as, oh, we're not going to win this bowl game now because we've got six guys that left early, take a look at the six guys that are in, out there playing and see, watch them and see because you're getting a look at what this team's going to look like the next year. Yeah, well, I, I mean, don't you tell. You can't solve all problems. You can't, you can't. But I mean, in Florida State's issue, where they've just had so many opt-outs well, and was, so many again, things. Well, if this was, if that happened next year, it wouldn't have been an issue. They no, wouldn't have lost all those players. Absolutely, it wouldn't have been. But that's because they were playing for something. I still think you need to up the ante a little bit in all of these random bowl uh, games. Yeah, up you're, the you're ante. You're paying more money. Pay them more money. No, not paying more money. I like the idea of playing for different, different, uh, like having a playoff, right, your, your college football, okay. national championship, play, and then having a Division set like an two. NIT. Yeah, like I, a, I'm, I'm on board with yeah. that, taking all these other teams and putting them in a tournament too. Exactly, and make all those and other – get rid of all these one-game bowl games. Yes, one, one yeah, put them in – make That's it, fine. I don't, yeah. I don't think bowl games are that cool anyway. I've always thought bowls were stupid. But you could still do the bowl games. You just put yeah. them in that second uh, – in that other bracket. I'm a that, little kid. Years ago, and I'm sitting here looking at college football. Oh, we got the bowl system. 
And I'm going, well, yeah, but in my hometown, we have the playoffs. And, yeah. You, <laughs> and teams can go all the way to the state championship. Mm -hmm. They don't play one stupid game and no, it's over. No. Why are they doing that in college? It's so really I've been dumb. against that as far back as the early, at least I, the mid 1950s. I agree with you. I think you got to give these so kids. So I like your idea. Yeah. Thank you. I, I like it too. An NIT, I really NIT of college football. I love it. Let's do it. I want to do it. Let's let's make it happen. Rob's forty five sixteen wants to know. Do you think Coach Guyton left voluntarily, or that it was best that he looked for another job? He could stay. Pretty much check that out. They wanted him to stay. He's a good coach. He recruits well. The players liked him. It was mm -hmm. his decision. Joe Kynes, years ago in ninety two, he started the year first game of the year. He's defensive coordinator. Then Jack Crow gets fired. For the next 11 games, Joe Kynes is the interim head coach. Then he didn't get the job. Danny Ford did, so he agreed to go back to being defensive coordinator the next year, 93. When it was over, he did a press conference, and he told all of us he made a mistake. He talked oh. about how hard it was to come back and go back to being that defensive coordinator under a guy that was beneath him but got the job. So uh, I think Guyton did the right thing. It's just not right. When you think you you got a big chance to do something and it doesn't work out, go somewhere else. Yeah. You're not going to end up resenting Petrino because he's got the job you wanted. You can't think about that because you're gone. You're gone yeah. somewhere else. I think also it was it was kind of the opportunity, too, to work at Wisconsin with Luke Fickle, who, right. he, who he has a relationship with. The opportunity kind of a, arose, and he kind of said, well, that's a really good opportunity because he was going around still doing recruiting visits and all those things. It looked like he was staying, and I think the way the wide receivers room reacted when he left, it kind of – they were like, oh, gosh – this is such a big blow. They kind of looked like it was like, hey, we thought he was staying, yeah. but he left. It looked like it was the opportunity. And and also what you said about, hey, you know, I just don't want to yeah. stay and be under somebody else like that. Um, Pigspeak asks, greater legacy, Nick Saban or John McDonald? Who oh, might? See, I don't look at things like this. Oh, People okay. do this all the time. Who's the greatest NBA player, Michael Jordan or LeBron? The, the I don't. Age old argument. <laughs> People have asked me, what's your favorite movie of all time? I don't have one. I have about 20, and they're all good in my mind. If you want to look at John McDonald, he's the greatest track coach in NCAA history. If you want to look at Nick Saban, greatest college football coach. If you want to look at uh, John Wooden, greatest basketball coach of all time. They each dominated their sport. And I don't feel any need to compare them beyond that because they okay. don't coach in the same sport. Like they're just that. the best at what you do. I love that. I, I, I'm I mean, what would you compare Nick Saban to the, the top scientist at NASA? You know, <laughs> you can pick anybody that's, that's at the top comparison. of the field. Yeah. I mean, so what? I mean, it's, you're, you're the best at what you do. Oh, well, there you go. Man Animal. Man Animal wants to know, do you think the coaches forced Satania to give up track and concentrate totally on football? I read where it was his idea, but I know how much he loves to do both. I haven't talked to anybody about this, but yeah. I got to believe it's a mutual decision. Look, he's in it, he's entering his junior year, and he's got a chance to be in the starting rotation, which he hasn't been in before. And he fits the mold of a Petrino type wide receiver because the guy likes speed, and he has a history of getting his receivers wide open. Yeah. If you get a, a Isaiah Satania wide open, he's going to score because of his speed. So I think they basically said, look. You need to learn this system this spring because we want to count on you in the fall. And why would you turn down that opportunity? Mm. Satania is a good track athlete. He's not going to win you, I think, an event at the NCAAs. Mike scores some points at, at, the, at, the, at the SEC meet. But unlike this kid that's coming in from A&M, and, and Alyssa told us that Chris Buckingham said that yep. Petrino told him they're encouraging him to run track this spring. Yeah. Why? Because he can score. He's capable of scoring at nationals. So I don't know what their plans are with him with regard to football, why they're willing to give, give him up at least part-time to football, but I think some of it is he can really help this track team a lot. Yes. He and the other guy, Isaiah Satinia, he needs to concentrate strictly on football right now. Yeah. And he could come back in, in two years if he, if he stays through his senior year and he's a starter for two years, wants to in the spring semester of his senior year go back to track and totally concentrate on that, he can. He absolutely can. I mean, that, you bring up that Texas A&M guy, and I actually asked Buck that question in that press conference, and I was it, he had so many good things to say about him, and you look at what he did with Kentucky's track and field team, and you know that guy can help Coach Buck and, yeah. and that team. So – 
I think maybe there's a difference where it's like, Satania, we may want to bring him back, concentrate more on football. He has an opportunity to make a real impact with us. But we'll give you this other guy, too, that I yeah. can do both. So, yeah. uh, as Giles says, since they're forcing all these changes on us that a lot of us don't like, how about the NCAA gives us something we want? I'm always football starved in the spring. Why can't schools play a spring game against other teams? Maybe two, maybe three. You're getting a little ahead of yourself <laughs> there with three. I don't think you're even going to get two. Yeah. Let's start with one because I agree it's a great idea. People yeah. have talked about it before. I don't understand why it hasn't happened. Because they're, I'm telling you. if Fear if, of them getting hurt, maybe? Uh, I don't know. It's one game. Yeah. You still have time to rehab unless it's a major injury. And the point is, it would jazz up the spring to know you're going to play somebody. As opposed to just, there is nothing any worse, trust me, than watching a team play itself. Because you don't learn anything no. from it. If the defense looks good, it means the offense looks bad. If they both sort of look okay, then you don't know. Yeah. But and when you play against somebody else, you know, we were good, we yeah. were bad. It's fun to watch that. When I was at Florida, they also, like, it was really funny because they had kind of a script of things that they wanted to happen in the spring game. Like, literally a script yeah. of, like, this guy will score a touchdown at this point. And and I'm like, how it's all can fake you, stuff. It's fake stuff. And I'm like, how can you get a good idea of what this team can do from something that's contrived? I think you're right. You would get a really good opportunity to look at them against some competition. Fun. Yeah. Let people give people a little slice of football right yeah. there in the middle of April or somewhere in there. And then if it works, yeah, maybe maybe two. It to two. I don't know about I don't three. I don't a lot. Three's <laughs> probably too much. You, you know, players still got to go to school and pass their final yeah. exams. You're getting into that time of the year when they take their finals. But two might work mm. if one works. Yeah. That's the way they've done the playoffs. Uh, yeah. We started with two teams and went to four. Now we're going to 12, you know. Yeah, yeah. Kind of inch keep, your way along Keep going there. along there. I kind of like the idea of one. But, again, I think the biggest thing coaches would say is injuries. They're just so – well. I think they're I liked, worried about injuries. I liked what S. Giles said about, yeah. hey, you're forcing all these changes on us we don't <laughs> like. How about doing something we do like? There you go. I like that. S. Giles, give us some more ideas on that uh, line of thought. I like that. Uh, that's going to do it for this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions. Stay warm out there, everybody.